And when we start to think about planting an herb garden, we want to think about what does our site look like? Um, what's our sun look like? Uh, what do we want to grow? Um, I, I always uh, tell people if you are not going to use it or you are not going to appreciate that plant in some way, don't grow it because we all like finding good deals for plants, but if you're not going to use or appreciate that plant, it takes up valuable space in our landscape. Um, think about what part of the plant you're going to use. So if we're using the tops or the bottoms of the plant, um, when we are growing herbs, um, think about how much time do you have? Do you wanna start those from seeds or do you wanna buy an already uh, started transplant? And then um, as every gardener knows, is it annual or perennial, which also, leads into that time factor. And so I love this photo on uh, the screen here. This is one of Dr. Haynes's photos of a basil uh, garden. And I think that's the home demonstration garden, if I remember right. Um, but it just goes to show you how beautiful uh, our herbs can be used as landscape plants. So when we start thinking about sun uh, site, we want to think about a uh, full sun environment, uh, average soil, and fertility. Some of our herbs are going to prefer a, mo a moist soil. Most of them are going to be um, just looking for that average home environment. If you are looking to do a, uh, a rainy or a moist spot in your garden, Think of mint, rosemary, or lemon balm. And then if you have that very dry, very sunny location, think of thyme and basil um, to fill those needs. When we start to think about, do we wanna do seeds or our transplants? Um, the best herbs come that come from seed are most of our annual uh, herbs. So basil, dill, parsley, cilantro, or coriander, depending on which part of the plant you're going to be using. Um, for those that aren't familiar, uh, coriander is the seeds for cilantro. Marjoram, um, this is one that you wanna start a little bit early uh, as it's slow to start. And then, if you're thinking about perennial herbs, sage is the easiest of the perennial herbs to start from seed. When we start thinking about existing plants or transplants, um, we can also start thinking about propagation. So cuttings, division, um, and starting new plants from existing plants. And for those, we wanna use our perennial herbs. Um, lavender is one of the, lavender and rosemary are ones that are very common for cuttings as well as sage. Um, tarragon is used in, um, cuttings and division because when it's seed started, it doesn't have a as full of flavor as it does from an existing plant. And then bay, marjoram, and mint as well. And we will talk about the whole situation that is mint uh, as we go forward. Uh, for those beginning gardeners um, that have not experimented with mint, um, I will share some warnings and some red flags that come with growing mint. Um, and for those that are experienced gardeners, you may have some of your own stories as well. All right, there are different places we can put our herbs as we talked about site, but one of the things that is great about herbs is they can be done very well in containers. Um, for those who may, have downsized a property or may just not be able to um, get down and 
work in a raised bed or a uh, in-ground garden, container herbs can be a uh, greater asset to the gardener's toolbox. They're easier for maintenance, a lot less space to weed. They're easier to harvest um, because you can put them anywhere. And I have found with growing my herbs that when they are closest to my kitchen, I use them more often. So uh, if I have window box herbs in my kitchen or um, some herbs on my back patio, that is easy to just step out when I'm doing my preparation for a meal and grabbing those herbs. Along with containers, um, we get reduced risk of disease um, because containers are easy, more um, moisture friendly when um, we incorporate that in there incorporate the proper uh, potty mix. Maintenance and care uh, for containers um, is very, very easy. It's a potential uh, issue to lose moisture faster um, because you're above ground as well as the wind blowing through your garden. Um, during the hottest months, you may require, you may have to check multiple times in the day um, to water. You always want to allow water to drain out of the bottom of the pot. No standing water, no wet feet. Um, as we'll talk about uh, with some of our herbs, they do not tolerate that wet feet very well. Um, we want to avoid excess fertilizer. Um, and this is because when we give our herbs, extra fertilizer, um, they can go to seed faster, they can get leggy, um, and we want that nice bushy controlled growth depending on the herb that we are growing. And then always pinch back to control spindly growth. So uh, if we look at some of the taller herbs that we have here, if they start to get really spread out between the nodes, we can pinch that bud at the top and it'll have that hormonal response to bush everything back out. As with any plant that we grow, uh, it has some common herb problems throughout all of our herbs. Um, so we can have some wilt, which herbs are always fun. Plants are always fun because you can have a problem like wilting and that can be from lack of water, but it can also be from too much water. So this is why you want to be checking your soil moisture those couple of times throughout the day when it starts to get warmer um, to help control um, your plants losing moisture. When herby plants that we're going to be using and harvesting start to lose moisture, that can be um, an issue if we're going to want to use those freshly. Uh, if leaf edges start to burn or die back or they turn dry and become brittle, that's usually a high salt problem. So this comes from either a excess in fertilizer or um, if you use the wrong water. So um, we actually had this happen at one of our community gardens. They put in a water softener and we weren't told that the faucet that we had changed, had been using, changed to soft water. So they put in a hard water one for us. Um, and we actually had some of our leaf edges on our plants start dying out um, because of that high salt from the softened water. Um, if our plants become leggy, leggy or spindly, this could be a low light situation or too much nitrogen. And then yellowing from the bottom um, can be caused um, by too much water 
or uh, low fertility. And then when we overwater, that's when we start to get those root rots. And root rots um, are never fun. Um, and that's why we say no wet feet for our herbs. And we want to have those good drainage holes. So no matter whether you are growing them outside or you're growing them inside, these are some common problems that we can have with our herbs. And to ensure that our herbs do well indoors, uh, we can look at a number of different herbs to grow indoors. Um, some common ones are chive, thyme, basil, parsley, rosemary, sage, oregano, and the mints. Um, we want to have some direct sunlight, so think of a southern or southwestern exposure of about six to eight hours a day. Um, and when we supplement our lights, we can use fluorescent lights. Um, a lot of us now have started to go to LED grow lights, um, but if you are still using a fluorescent light, you want to uh, think on this formula, that one hour of natural light equals two hours under fluorescent lights. So if you're just using your indoor fluorescent lights, you're going to be wanting to have 12 to 16 hours of light on your plants. Um, and when we put our um, light source on our plants, we want that to be about six to 12 inches from the leaves. Um, if we get any closer, depending on the type of light that you are using, there could be some burning issues of the leaves from the heat. Um, and if we put it too far away, then our plants start to get very leggy and spindly um, because they're starting to grow towards the light and those internode links and internodes, instead of being short, will start growing longer. So when we're looking at growing our herbs indoor, we want to still think about some of the same things that we need for outdoor. So drainage, temperature, fertilization. For drainage, uh, we always want to use a well-drained media. So um, common examples, peat, perlite, vermiculite, or a mixture of the three. Um, it depends what is available at your local garden store, or if you are one who likes to create your own mix, um, any of that is perfectly well, as long as it um, is well drained. And so most of the pre bought mixes that we get are going to be a mix of peat and perlite. Temperature, uh, our herbs are going to prefer temperatures below 70 degrees. Um, so one of the big things to think about in the winter time, which um, we all have to think about right now, is keeping them away from heating vents. And I can tell you um, that I had some plants that were in a window, um, my south window for my indoor plants, and I actually had twofold of an issue. Um, so on the front by the window, it started to get too cold. And so I needed to move them for that reason. But on the back side, on the floor, is a heat vent that came up. And so I was having warm herbs in the back and cold herbs in the front, which affected their growth. And so now that I've moved them away from uh, the window and away from the heat vent, they're doing a lot better. They're starting to bounce right back. Um, if you have low humidity in your house right now, uh, which many of us do with the dry winter air, uh, having pebble trays to catch that water drain off and then it'll evaporate into the air helps with our humidity issues. Fertilization, uh, it's always beneficial for occasional feeding. Um, general pur purpose fertilizer works well. Um, I tend to take the winters off with fertilizing and when it's 
the active growing season, so starting March through about September, then I start to fertilize more. Right now, um, I fertilized in the fall and giving them fertilizer now, depending on your setup, can be uh, an issue to get higher salts. So uh, with lower temperatures and lower sunlight or grow lights, if you're not having grow lights, you can have uh, a buildup of that fertilizer because they're not actively using that fertilizer like they would be. All right, so let's start with our perennial herbs and we'll go through these. Um, the first one is French tarragon and this prefers full sun and well-drained soil. Um, and when we look at harvesting our French tarragon, we're gonna look at harvesting it depending on its use. And so if we are going to harvest it for making herbal vinegars, we want to harvest it in June. But if we are going to be using it in a dry form, we're going to want to harvest that in July. And that distinction has to do with the tenderness of the leaf for the purpose that we're using it for. So smaller leaves are better for vinegar. If we're going to be drying, we want a more sturdy leaf to hold up to the drying process. Um, often French tarragon is used in sauces, especially white sauces um, and herbal vinegars. So I will admit I do not grow a lot of French tarragon just for the fact that I don't use it very often. Um, so I tend to grow what I tend to use more often. And I think that's a lot of a philosophy for a lot of gardeners. Chives, um, this one grows to be about a 12 inch by 12 inch habit. Um, so a nice foot by a foot. Um, this can get aggressive um, and comes in onion and garlic flavors. Um, Garlic chive, always the best. Um, that's just for my personal taste and use. Um, I love this plant because as you can see on the screen, the beautiful uh, white or pink flowers, these happen to be the pink ones, um, which attract pollinators. Um, and it does reseed, which apl applies to its aggressiveness so it can spread. Um, if you don't want it to recede, you can deadhead it and remove those flowers. Um, and the other thing that you want to do to rejuvenate your chive plant, every three years you want to divide it. So if we don't divide it every three years, that center starts to get too big and then the center starts to die out. Lavender. Um, Lavender is one of our tender perennials, um, which can be an issue for us here. Um, I'll speak for myself. I'm in Northwest Illinois, um, which is right across uh, from Clinton, Iowa, for those who are doing the geography map in their head. Uh, so if you go from Clinton straight across, that's where you'll find me. Um, and with it being a tender perennial, it doesn't have that cold tolerance. Uh, it prefers that warmer environment, but there are hardier cultivars out there now that can withstand our Iowa and Illinois Midwestern winters, um, which I'm gonna knock on wood here because we've had some good temperatures so far this winter. Um, this prefers well-drained soils, no wet feet, and this can be used in an ornamental or an edible fashion. So the pictures on the screen show you why it is a good, beautiful plant to have in your landscape um, or one of the um, great edible herbs um, with the boom in lavender cookies, lavender soda, plenty of different um, uses there. Uh, this is also one that can be used 
uh, for those aromatherapy herbs. Um, a lot of people will create those lavender sachets as well to carry around with them. Sage, uh, this is one of the longer lived perennials. Um, and this one is about a 12 to 20 inches tall, uh, gets about 15 inches wide, uh, a wide array of leaf colors. So it can be a gray green, purplish, um, or yellow green but it has that leathery texture. And if you're somebody who likes adding texture to your garden, this is a plant you'll wanna put in there. Um, sage to, has a lot of different cultivars in there. Um, one of the pictures that I've got coming up is a pineapple sage, which is one of the best to smell in my opinion, uh, just because I love pineapple so much. Um, this is a full sun, well-drained plant. Um, it can get woody at the base of the sage. Um, it will get root rot in moist conditions. So sage, if you're doing a tally sheet here, sage, absolutely no wet feet. If you're putting this in a container, it needs to be in those uh, drainage holes and a good mix. Um, seeds do not store well for this one. So uh, purchase new seeds every year or take cuttings from existing plants. Time, who's got the time? Um, time is another one of those uh, plants that gets about 12 inches tall by 12 inches wide. This one has small aromatic leaves with beautiful pink and white floral clusters. Um, they're low growing, which can also be used as a ground cover. Um, they require well-drained soils. Um, they do not do well in any poor or substandard soil. Um, and they do not prefer a uh, poor dry soil. So that well-drained soil where they're going to get a good moisture content is going to be best for them. Oregano. Um, oregano is a herb that we grow for our leaves, um, for those aromatic leaves. Um, gets about 24 inches tall um, by about 18 to 24 inches wide. And beautiful flowers on here. I love the um, the pistils on our uh, oregano that just kind of stick out of the uh, the flower there. Um, there are many species of um, oregano that we can grow here. Uh, so Greek oregano, common oregano, and then sweet marjoram, which is uh, used in a lot of dishes. Um, one of the things that I also love about oregano is that there are gold leaf cultivars available and those need partial shade. So plants should be cut back before flowering to promote that vegetative growth. So this is one of those plants that you want to think about. Am I using this as a landscape plant to have these beautiful flowers? Or am I going to use it as an herb and I want to grow it for its leaves? So when you think about that, then you want to decide, okay, I'm growing it for herbs. I'm going to grow it for its leaves. I want to uh, dry, have, have a big enough crop that I dry at the end of the year. So I want to cut those flowers back so that it remains in that vegetative state. Oregano is also one of the plants that has some disease and insect issues with it. So it does not like wet feet. It gets root rot. It can have issues with aphids and spider mites, as well as leaf miners. All right, so mint. Mint uh, is one of those plants that you either love it, you hate it, or you love to eat it, but you hate to grow it. Um, so this one gets 18 to 24 inches tall and spreads. 
spreads, spreads, spreads. Um, so this one has the potential to be extremely invasive. Um, it loves to grow in full sun. It can grow in full shade. Uh, it loves a well-drained soil, um, but it is aggressive. Um, there are variegated cultivars of mint available, um, and you can get multiple types of mint. So you can get spearmint, peppermint. Um, I think there was even a chocolate mint plant last I looked. Um, sounds delicious. Um, this is one that you always want to plant in a container. Um, I also tell people mint is a plant that you will grow and sometimes continue to grow forever. Um, so you can plant it outside in your yard, um, do the sunken pot. So have a pot at the bottom that is buried in the soil and then plant the mint plant in another pot to set inside. Um, mint has the ability to spread from its roots, from its seeds, um, and will continue growing. Um, there are some people that love to grow this plant outside. Um, I am one that I grow all of my mint inside, um, just because I've heard some stories about mint growing under sidewalks and starting to grow on the other side. Um, what happens when you run a lawnmower through it? Um, it can rejuvenate from some of those pieces. So um, be cautious with your mint. All right, so let's go on to our annual herbs. Um, and we'll start with parsley. Parsley is actually a biennial. So when we think of parsley, it grows the same way that a carrot does, where it has um, the ability to grow one, grow vegetatively the first year. And then if we let it overwinter, it will produce seeds for us. Since we are growing parsley to harvest the leaves, um, we only keep it for that growing season. Um, parsley has a tendency to be 6 to 12 inches tall and 12 to 15 inches wide. This one will grow well in part shade. It also grows well in full sun. Um, and this is one where you can continue to harvest the leaves repeatedly. Um, and there are two types of parsley that you can grow. There's flat leaf parsley, which is the one that most of us uh, use for flavoring. Or you could grow the curly leaf, which uh, a lot of restaurants back in the day used to use this as the garnish on a plate, um, but still has some flavor. Um, so we can see here in the, the picture, we've got flat leaf parsley as well as the curly leaf parsley. Basil, uh, basil is one of the easiest um, to grow of the annual herbs. Um, so you can get it depending on the cultivar, um, one foot to three feet tall, two feet wide. Um, this grows well in containers. It grows well in ground. So if you remember back to uh, the second or third picture that I showed you of the uh, landscape, that was all basil cultivars. Uh, it loves sunny, dry, hot spots. Um, so if you have an area in your yard that's sunny, dry, and always hot, that is the place to grow your basil. Um, there are lots of varieties of basil available, um, more than I could probably name in this hour-long presentation. Uh, but there are four common types of basil that most people are familiar with, and those are pictured here. So Thai basil, uh, large Italian basil, purple basil, and then lemon basil. Um, this is another one where you harvest the leaves repeatedly. 
Um, you'll want to prune it every two to three weeks to remove any flowers and to keep those plants compact. Um, green cultivars are best for cooking and the purple ones are used for more ornamental or fresh um, consumption. Flowers should remove be removed to continue to promote that vegetative growth. Now, one of the things that I love about teaching herbs is I just teach, taught you guys about parsley and I showed you a picture of parsley. And when we put it right next to this herb, they look identical. So cilantro leaves and parsley leaves, the flat version of parsley, looks very familiar to cilantro. Um, cilantro grows one to three feet tall and a foot wide. Um, and we use the uh, foliage we call cilantro and the seed is coriander. So the coriander that you might use for cooking is the same seeds that we plant for growing new cilantro. Uh, this bolts well, in, or bolts, not well, bad side effect. It bolts in warm weather. So you wanna be careful and just remove that bolt. For those that are not familiar, bolting is uh, a response to extreme heat. And so it produces a flower stalk. And we just remove that out of there in order to keep the plant vegetative. It does well in full sun. When it starts to get very big, uh, it may need staking. This is one that you may notice during the hot, humid months starts to have some issues. It does not tolerate high humidity well. Um, so usually in about August, um, you can see some issues with cilantro. Uh, when the plant blooms and seed, it then dies. So if you don't want your cilantro plant to die, um, keep it from going to seed. Now, I mentioned the fact that parsley and cilantro look alike um, because there is actually a genetic mutation that part of the population has, and I'm, I can safely attest to this as one who thinks cilantro is absolutely terrible. So, uh, when I eat cilantro and those of us with the genetic mutation eat cilantro, it tastes like dish soap. Um, so this is usually one of those ingredients where you either love it or you hate it. Um, and it can be simply just based on your taste. Um, so if you ever wondered why some people say, oh, this tastes like soap, it's because of that mutation in the taste. Um, I also mentioned that because if you go to the store, uh, sometimes parsley and cilantro will be right next to each other. Um, and if you don't like it, you don't wanna get it mixed up. Cilantro does have a more distinct flavor, uh, not flavor, uh, sense of smell to it than parsley does. So usually you can tell by slightly rubbing the leaf um, if it is cilantro or parsley. Dill, um, I love dill. I will say this is probably my favorite herb. Um, it grows big, it's three feet tall, can get up to 18 inches across. Uh, the feathery blue leaves are just a beautiful color to me, especially against those yellow flowers. Um, full sun, well-drained soil. Um, this is a plant that will reseed easily. Um, so when you start seeing these flowers pop up, if you don't want a lot of dill seed to pop up in your garden next year, um, remove the flowers as they occur. Um, one thing that you can do is if you do want it to come back next year, but you don't want like a whole area of dill, 
to come up, you can selectively deadhead. So um, remove some of the flowers, let some of the flowers go to seed, that seed will fall down um, and it'll grow or have the potential to grow for next year. Um, dill is also one of those plants um, that can require some staking. So it does get that big um, area, which if it starts to get floppy because of the wind, uh, you may just need to stake it up. Um, the other thing I was going to mention for dill, it is a pollinator magnet. So it, it attracts butterflies to it. So this is one of those um, herbs that does well for you as well as some of our pollinator friends. Just like cilantro and parsley look very similar, dill also has um, a counterpart that looks very familiar too, and that is fennel. So dill and fennel look very similar. Um, full sun, well-drained soil. There can be green and bronze types. This also reseeds very freely. Um, for fennel, you can grow it for the fronds, which is the green part uh, pictured here next to this flower, or fennel can also have the types where you grow it for the bulb and then dig it up for the fennel bulb. Rosemary, um, it is a tender perennial slash annual that gets between four and six feet tall with four four feet wide. This is one of our plants that when we put it in containers like you see there on the left, we can overwinter it. Uh, loves full sun, moist, well-drained soils. Um, has a very unique needle-like foliage uh, with blue and white flowers, and it has an upright to trailing habit. Um, it does not tolerate wet soils, but should not be allowed to completely dry out. So it has those temperamental roots where it doesn't like to be wet, but it doesn't like to be completely dry. This is one where if you want to treat it more like a shrub, you can trim it and shape it into a, uh, a, a small shrub. It does have some disease and insects issues with aphids, mealybugs, and spider mites. Um, this can be a problem when you bring it in for the winter. Um, powdery mildew is a issue that rosemary can have uh, when it's a cool, moist situation. So usually early spring when it's still cool and a lot of rain, you can have some powdery mildew issues on rosemary. All right, I promised you pineapple sage and here it is. It is beautiful. Um, and this helps us get into our harvesting of fresh herbs. So we can harvest our herbs multiple ways. Um, but when we harvest our fresh herbs, we want to harvest the leaves before flowering. When we let them go to flower, that starts to take away from their preservability, their leaf quality, um, as well as their flavor components. So we want to pick herbs close to the time that you're going to use them. Um, fresh, fresh herbs are always better when they're ready to use right before picking. Um, sometimes though we just can't help it and we have to pick them and bring them in, but I've got a solution for you on that one in just a few minutes. So in most cases you harvest the leaves, but in other cases for our herbs we harvest uh, other parts to be used. So fennel, we could harvest the bulb, uh, cilantro, we can harvest the seed, which is coriander. It all depends on how you're going to use your herb and what you're going to use it for. Um, harvesting, so annual herbs, anytime before flowering, you can cut them back severely. And um, if you want the plant to for next year, you can let it go to seed um, and let it mature and harvest that seed after it flowers. 
Our perennial herbs, you never want to do a heavy cutback. Just with every perennial, you only want to remove up to a third at a time. Um, when we and do a heavy cut or a heavy prune that affects the the future of our plant um, depending on if that has a crown or an underground structure we start taking um, that energy needed for the fall and i love this picture here um, because this is actually a flower bouquet for a wedding that's made out of basil so our herbs are not just for cooking or for crafting or for harvesting, you can use them as bouquets in your house, which also make your house smell really good. Storing our fresh herbs. Um, so you wanna snip off the end of the stems on the diagonal. So just like when you get a fresh bouquet of flowers, you make that diagonal cut and then you wanna put them in water. Herbs can be placed in a tall glass with about an inch of water, uh, cover loosely with either plastic wrap or a plastic bag, and then store those in re your refrigerator as you need, or, and replace the water when it gets um, cloudy. Usually that cloudiness starts to be microbial growth. Or um, there's another traditional way you can do it, uh, wrapping your herb in a damp paper towel, placing that in a plastic bag, and placing that in a refrigerator. So for herbs that have a longer hardy stem, um, those could be cilantro, parsley, and mint. Um, basil, does not refrigerate well. So when basil is exposed to cooler temperatures, the leaves start to turn black. Um, so you can see in the picture here, this is basil and it does have a flower on it, um, but this basil is not in a refrigerator, it's sitting on a kitchen counter. Um, herbs last about a week by storing them in the fridge either way by putting them in water or the paper towel. Now, what do you do if you have so many herbs you don't know what to do with? Well, one of the great things about uh, herbs is if you're going to be using them in a sauce or a soup or a cooked dish, you can freeze those by using an ice cube tray. Um, so you can freeze either the whole herb or you can freeze just uh, the chopped up herb. Um, although some herbs tend to get um, strong or bitter when frozen, whole herbs can be thawed and then chopped and used in cooked dishes. Uh, these are usually not suitable for garnish as you're breaking the uh, cell walls and they start to get limp when they become thawed. Uh, if you're gonna do the chopped herbs um, and put them in water and olive oil and freeze, those are usually best for soups and sauces. Um, these frozen herbs you wanna use within about four to six months for best quality and to avoid any freezer uh, burn issues. Drying herbs, I love this picture. I wish I could say it's mine. Um, I wish I could say I had a spot like this in my house. Um, but this is what I would picture if I ever had a drying room. Um, so drying fresh herbs, um, usually what most people are familiar with are washing the herbs, patting them dry, and then hanging them upside down in a well-ventilated room like we are seeing here um, in the picture. Um, for sturdy herbs, such as rosemary, sage, and thyme, you want to tie them in small bundles. For tender herbs, you want to tie them into small bundles and suspend them in a paper bag by closing the top with a rubber band and cut small holes in the bag. So those tender herbs that you would want to dry this way are oregano, tarragon, 
lemon balm, and mint. So the reason why these four are considered tender is because they have a higher moisture content and can mold more quickly uh, if they're, can mold quickly if they're not dried quickly. Um, microwaving herbs, uh, if you still have your, oh, this might date me. Uh, if you still have uh, the, the handbook that comes with your microwave, uh, there are some instructions in the recipe section to dry herbs. Um, I've done this before with dill, um, usually using the defro defrost setting and doing it for like 30 seconds at a time, if that, um, and then gauging its moisture content to then break it down. Uh, you can always dehydrate your herbs. Um, this takes one to four hours depending on your herb. Um, on humid days, our oven drying, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, is especially nice for mint, sage, and bay because the leaves dry flat and remain a good color. So on those humid days, um, you want to do it for mid mint, sage, and bay. Uh, you want to lay your uh, herbs on a paper towel without allowing them to touch. Cover them with another paper of towel and you can layer this about five times and you're just going to stick it in the dry cool oven and just turn the oven light on and that provides enough heat to um, overnight dry your herbs. For drying fresh herbs, um, leaves are dry when they're crispy. They crumble easily between your fingers. Um, you may leave them whole or crumble them, depending on how you're going to use them for your recipe. Um, when we store our herbs, we want to place them in airtight containers that are cool, dry, and dark. So the most common place that people store their herbs in their home cabinet is either next to the oven or above the oven because they just grab them when they use them. But the heat and the moisture from the oven can cause dried herbs to lose their color and their flavor faster even if they're just in the cupboard. All right and then I'm going to end with recipe conversions. So this is a slide that I always say if you've got a smartphone or a camera or even a pen and paper uh, to write this down uh, just because it's so handy to have. I have this uh, on the inside of my spice cabinet as an easy remember uh, for when I'm switching between fresh herbs, dry herbs, and uh, crumbled herbs or ground herbs.